do as God does. After all, you are dear children. Let love be your guide. Christ loved us and offered his life for us as a sacrifice that pleases God. You are God's people, so don't let it be said that any of you are immoral or indecent or greedy. Don't use dirty or foolish or filthy words. Instead, say how thankful you are. Being greedy, indecent or immoral is just another way of worshipping idols. You can be sure that people who behave in this way will never be part of the kingdom that belongs to Christ and to God. Don't let anyone trick you with foolish talk. God punishes everyone who disobeys him and says foolish things. So don't have anything to do with anyone like that. You used to be like people living in the dark, but now you are people of the light because you belong to the Lord. So act like people of the light and make your light shine. Be good and honest and truthful as you try to please the Lord. Don't take part in doing those worthless things that are done in the dark. Instead, show how wrong they are. It is disgusting even to talk about what is done in the dark, but the light will show what these things are really like. Light shows up everything, just as the scriptures say, wake up from your sleep and rise from death, then Christ will shine on you. Act like people with good sense and not like fools. These are evil times. So make every minute count. Don't be stupid. Instead, find out what the Lord wants you to do. Don't destroy yourself by getting drunk, but let the Spirit fill your life. When you meet together, sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs as you praise the Lord with all your heart. Always use the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to thank God the Father for everything. Honour Christ and put others first. Good morning and welcome to Restore this morning. I hope you enjoyed the worship. Um, huge thanks to Michelle and Nathan and Hayley for leading us uh, so beautifully in worship this morning. Um, I have got lots to say this morning and I'm going to try and condense it down. So it's really, I'm really excited for this morning. Um, so I hope you're kind of on the edge of your seat. If you take notes, get your notepad out because I think this morning is going to be a cracker. I'm really hoping so. I feel like God's really put something in my heart for this morning. So a bit like Reynard said last week, we're going to go three, two, one, go. Um, but first of all, I want to say, who is excited for a haircut this week? I like, thank you, Jesus. I cannot wait to get my haircut. I've got an appointment booked in. And so um, next time you see me, I'll be a new woman. So excited. Um, I hope you are too. But I will be wearing a mask. Um, I drove past my hairdressers yesterday just to see what the deal was. And I could see he was, he was wearing his visor and everything was well done. So I'm pretty confident that I can go in safely and get my haircut. That's enough talk about haircuts. <laughs> yeah, but I am very, very out of proportion looking forward to that this week. Um, so this week we're carrying on with Ephesians and Reframe uh, series and this week we're looking at Reframe Life and particularly from Ephesians 4 to 6. And so the first few weeks we looked at chapter 1 and what was in there and the big picture, then chapter 2, uh, the new humanity, chapter 3, uh, reframing love. And then 4, 5 and 6 are kind of the, the themes flow between them. So it's not so set on, on chapters. And so we'll be around 4, 5 and 6 today. Um, but I love that Tim Mackey quote that I used right in the first week uh, where it says, In Ephesians, Paul summarises the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. Paul summarises the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. And I, I'm just so thankful to Tim Mackey and the Bible Project. Just They've really helped me go so much deeper into Ephesians over these last couple of months and has kind of been preparing for this and studying it. And so thankful for their insight and their wisdom and their research and how they communicate that. So really want to encourage you, if you haven't gone into the Bible Project yet and Tim Mackey, 
get involved because his teaching is really great and how he brings out some of the truths in the scripture uh, that I just haven't necessarily seen before. And so we've talked about how Ephesians 1 to 3 is, is kind of God's story and focusing on that. And then there's a shift in 4, 5 and 6 uh, where it starts to talk about how that story, God's story, shapes and reframes our own life story. And last week, um, Arena, or Rainy as we now call him, uh, <laughs> looked at unity and, and how the practical outworking of this stuff in our everyday lives and I, I just think Paul's so great for doing that. He said, here's the big story, the big picture of Jesus coming to save us. He redeemed us. He, he's restored us. He loves us. We're a new humanity. And this is then how that impacts you. And not just in theory, but really practical. And it gets really down to the nitty gritty in this, this little section. And it talks about what it's going to require of us, our life habits, uh, our character traits, um, our moral commitment, our relational commitment. And it's all in there in these couple of pages. And there's so much there that we do not have time to go in today. And I, I just want to encourage you, after today, do take time to look at chapters 4, 5 and 6. In fact, go to 1, 2, 3 again and read 4, 5, and 6 in light of that and study it and unpack it. We could do this series for months and I think not get to the bottom of it. If you only read one thing in the Bible, read Ephesians. That's where I'm at at the moment. I'm just so stuck in it. And how Paul calls us, kind of what, what's required of us to live in this, this new way and this different kind of community together. And so chapter five, we had read uh, part of it by Yoande and, and family. So thank you so much. Well done. And we get this passage on how to live. And it's tough. I don't know. I grew up going to Sunday school and it just felt like a bunch of rules and regulations, if you ask me. And he, then he goes on after that bit that we didn't even get to in the reading. But it goes on to that bit about wives and husbands and then slaves and masters and children and parents and very talked about, very argued about, and they're really tricky passages. And so Paul gets kind of this bad rep for being the moral police and just being someone who, who calls us to, to this hard way of living, like, man, Paul, do you know how tough this stuff is? And I just want to unpack kind of the, the framing of those words before, we, so that when we go into them in our own time during this week, we understand the framework that Paul's put them in to help us reframe how we think about them. So chapter 5 opens with this verse that says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fa fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so he opens it up with, with that verse and I was taught um, back in the day that if you saw the word therefore it meant that something came before and so you had to go and look at kind of the passages before that now I do recognize that the way the word therefore is in that sentence doesn't actually call for us to look back to what came before but I did anyway and it has changed how I look at what we had read by Yoande and family and what Paul then goes on to in those really tricky passages about submission between wives and husbands and slaves and masters and children and parents. It's totally reframed it. And that's what I want to share with you this morning because it's, it's really opened up for me. And I, I pray God's going to do the same for you this morning. And so here we go. We're going to frame this, this teaching in, in what Paul says before this because he opens up this part calling us new humans kind of calling us these new humans, and then, and then calls us to live like that. Kind of a classic example of what it means to be a Christian, to adopt a way of life and live it out, a new identity, and live in that new story of that new identity. Sounds simple, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's really powerful what Paul's doing here. So what does it mean to live? He's saying, what does it mean to live in day-to-day -day life circumstances, in tough times, in good times, in the reality of of this gospel that we've been called to together as a family of people called church, this new humanity? What does that actually look like in real life? And Paul address, addresses all sorts of things. He talks about anger, he talks about selfishness, he talks about sex, he talks about uh, relationships, he talks about uh, how we talk and how we live, he talks about marriage and parenting and money and lying, and the list goes on. I mean, there's pretty much 
every aspect of life covered by Paul as he talks about these things. Everything to talk about how we live in the light, in, in the light of chapters 1 to 3, God's big story, God's big picture. But the problem is these parts of the letter are really challenging and they're really tough. And when I've read them in the past, I think, man, how am I going to live up to that? That's a high moral code. That's really hard to, to live that way every day, generous and encouraging and truthful and peaceful. I'm just being really honest here. I find that really hard 24-7. How am I ever going to live up to that in this new identity? How am I going to live like God's called me to? It's, it's like an impossible task. And we can feel like Paul's getting in our face a bit about how we should live and, like I said, a bit like the moral police. And like, oh, shouldn't do that. And depending on your experience of the Bible and your experience of Christianity, it might feel like he's saying, you can do that, but you can't do that. You can do that, but you can't do that. And it's just a bit of thou shalt and thou shalt not. And it's just not easy to read if we haven't got the right framework. And so that's what we're going to put in place today because I think Paul is less concerned about our behaviour than he is our identity. He sees that there's a deeper issue going on that impacts the way we behave and the way we live our life story. And so that's what he wants to really unpack in this. He's more concerned with addressing the core sources and the core motivations for how we live than our actual behaviour. And so in in these chapters, we're going to look at, in the light of the gospel, who are you? Who am I? And if I'm changing because of who I am in Christ then my behaviour will naturally change. It just follows. See, when we try and live the high moral code without the true identity, it's going to be really hard going. But when we address our core identity, then the behaviour just follows. The living the life story as God's called us to just follows. And so we're going to jump back to chapter 4, verse 17. And Paul says this to the Ephesians that he's writing to. He says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Now, I don't know about you, but I can read over those two verses and not really think much about them, but Paul's done something brilliant there. He said, you must no longer live as Gentiles do. Now, just think for a minute, who's reading this letter that's been written by Paul? Gentiles. So he's writing to Gentiles saying, you must no longer live as Gentiles. And they're going, but that's who we are. That's what I am. I'm a Gentile. I'm a non-Jew. I'm not Jewish. What are you saying? Don't don't live. What? And he's saying, in light of chapters one to three, or the beginning of the letter, it wasn't in chapters, but in light of everything I've just said, says Paul, don't you see your primary identity is no longer Gentile. Your primary identity is now as a new human in Christ. And that is... It's not Jew, it's not Gentile, it's being part of the new humanity, made new in Jesus. And he's challenging that right from the start. And so he gets practical and he's saying, but it doesn't matter if you're Greek or you're Roman, you're Jew or you're Gentile, you're male or you're female, that's not your primary identity anymore. Your primary identity is being a new human and part of this new humanity in Jesus. And that's a different kind of framework to have that as our our first and foremost identity, who we say we are, who we know we are. And so Paul's challenging people right from the start to become who we really are. He's saying, you think you're a Gentile, but that's not who you are anymore. Who you actually are is this other kind of person. And then I was reminded as I was reading it of my eldest niece, 
Esme, who some of you know. Uh, she's nine now, I know, can't believe it. And when she was very small, uh, my brother and my sister-in-law uh, were given some words by God uh, to pray over her, and they would pray over her the, the, and say to her, kind of, you're brave, you're kind, and you're beautiful on the inside and out. You're brave, you're kind, and you're beautiful. And they would treat her as though she was already those things. And they would create an environment in which she could be brave and kind and be beautiful. And so they treated her uh, where she was already those things. And it's amazing that they had those words. They, they haven't had the same words for all four of their kids. But those were the words for Esme. And then aged just about two, just under two, um, she went into hospital and was in and out of hospital uh, for most of her early life. But she was brave. She lived as though she was already brave. And so she would have blood tests and needles put in, a cannulas put in with no num numbing cream, age two, three, four. She was brave. She, um, even up to now, last um, December we were on holiday and we went to a water park. And I love water parks. And there was a, a surf ride, I don't know if you've seen them, and there were two surf rides, actually, surfboard rides. There was the easier one that was kind of flat. There was a bit of a queue for that one. And then there was a tougher one for the slightly more advanced people. And we were walking along and we saw the queue. Collinses do not queue. We don't like queuing. <laughs> this pandemic's been a real challenge. Um, <laughs> but we, so we went straight to the advanced one. And Esme was like, yeah, I'll do it. I, she was eight at the time. I was a bit unsure whether I would do it. And I consider myself quite brave. But she... She went for it. She did it. And she actually stayed on longer than I did. But she, she summoned, she, she believes she's brave because that's what she's been called. She lives as though she is a brave person because she's been called into that time and time again. This is who you are. And that's what, exactly what Paul's doing. He's saying to them, you are new humans. You are this new humanity. You're not Gentiles anymore. Well, you are, but that's not your primary identity. Who you are is this new humanity. And I think God wants to, to frame us that same way, saying, you think you're this, but you're not. You're this new humanity. And so we have to look at everything through this lens, this framework of this new humanity. And it totally revolutionises who we are. And then our behaviour starts to follow. Ah, like, oh, I'm a new human. Hmm, maybe I'll live, like, maybe I'll make a different choice today. That was the old Jody. This is the new humanity Jody. And so we start to, to do that. And so Paul, we're going to look at what Paul says about how to live life and, and reframing it, looking through that lens of being new humans and who we really are. And then verse 17 and 19 paints a really bleak portrait. We're not going to go into it. Um, but basically of who they no longer have connections um, to uh, who they used to be. They've lost sensitivity to evil. Basically, they've become a bit hardened making choices because they've hardened themselves against kind of the morality of it, become calloused. And verse 20 says, that's not the way you learned, was it? Come on now, that's not the Jesus way. Remember when you heard about Jesus and you're like, whoa, that's changed my life. And you kind of go from, we call it repentance, you turn one, from one way to another. That's how you were taught. You've got to think through the implications of how you were taught. And then verse 22, this is where we're going to stand, sit and uh, camp for a bit this morning. So verse 22 to 24, he says, You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so this is what we're going to focus on this morning. Just three things. Number one, put off your old self that's being corrupted by deceitful desires. Number two, be made new in the attitude of your minds. And three, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And, and Albert did a, a lovely example for us of an illustration where he had the old things, he had his old self on, and then he took them off and he put on his new self. And um, the word self there can be, depending on the translation, can be man or human um, in other translations, but basically um, self is anthropos, so humanity. 
It's humanity. Put off your old humanity and put on your new humanity. He says, this is what you taught. You heard the good news of Jesus and it taught you to take off your old identity. This robe, take your shirt and coat off. Take it off. That's what you were taught. You come to Jesus and you take off. You go, oh, that's who I was. I take off. He says, this is the way you were taught. Take off your old humanity. And you're like, great, Paul. Easier said than done. That's why we have living free courses. But that's, it's, it sounds, he just take off your old humanity. Just take it off. And he says, you, you've got to take off this old humanity because it's, you're being corrupted by deceitful desires. And again, you can gloss over that really quickly, but thinking again about how Paul's view of how we behave and why we behave the way we do, he gets, he gets to kind of back to our identity through talking about these desires. Because as humans, we all have desires. Uh, they're good desires mostly, desires to be in relationship with people, uh, desires to be known and known uh, by others, uh, to, to have my basic needs cared for, um, a desire to be in community of people that I know and love and know me, the desire to have meaningful work and feel good and the desire to contribute to community. And they're all good desires. But Paul's saying that in the old humanity where we're darkened, we're not living as children of light, where, where we're darkened, kind of we become the judges of what's right and wrong. And these desires that are good, they'll actually trick us because they're deceitful. He's saying those desires will make you think they're the ultimate be-all and end-all, that they're the thing we're going for. If I could just achieve that career status, if I could just become financially stable, if I could just, these desires, if I could just get married, if I could just have kids, if I could just... And these desires, which are good in and of themselves, become de deceitful in our old humanity because we think they're the be-all and end-all. And he's saying that's where you find... So you end up finding your identity in those things. You end up finding your identity in how successful you are or where your kids go to school or university or how big your house is or what car you drive. And, and suddenly our identity is wrapped up in all that stuff because our des desires have become deceitful in our old humanity. He's saying, don't be tricked that your identity is in that stuff. Don't be tricked into letting that stuff drive you. Because if you let that stuff drive you, do you know what? You're going to end up lying and stealing and being unkind to people. That's the behaviour that follows. But actually, remember, that's your old humanity. You're running from one desire to the next. But when you heard the good news of Jesus and you were taught to take off your old humanity, because that's not who you are anymore. You and I don't have to prove who we are by achieving those desires. They're not where we find our identity. I'm the new me. I'm the brave, kind and beautiful me. That's who I'm being called to be, the, the new humanity. And so we need to reframe our thinking. We need to shift the attitude in our minds. Paul doesn't say, take off the old self and say a sinner's prayer. He says something much bigger than that. He says, take off the old self and renew your mind. Wow. For me, that changes the framework of how I look at life and holiness in particular. He says, take off the old humanity and reframe your life in a new way of thinking. Because we have ways of thinking about who we are and our identity and how we get by in the world and how much we're worth and the value that our life has depending on how we're raised and things like that. But then the gospel enters our lives, the good news, the big picture of Jesus for this new humanity, this Father's love that Jude talked about. And it messes with your life. If the gospel hasn't wrecked you, then ask God to show you what it truly means to, to live a life as part of his story. Because it totally reshapes who we are. And we almost need to go back and rebuild our lives again, rebuild our, our thinking of who we are and our understanding of who we are. And again, living free is a great um, 
great course to do in the seeing where we've really held on to old humanity and that way of thinking in our lives and go, oh, I need to take that off, renew my mind and live in the new humanity. And it's really, really great. And Paul says, look, don't, don't, don't worry about it. We all, we've all left a trail of wreckage behind us. We've all bent the rules at times. We've all failed. We've all messed up. Just own it. That was my old humanity. That's my old humanity. And recognise that if we're ever going to do anything good, it's going to come from outside of ourselves. You know, when I was 15, I looked around at the church I was living in. Um, living in? Well, <laughs> living in, I was going to. Maybe a more deep and meaningful than I realised. And we did spend quite a lot of time at church. But the, <laughs> I looked around at the people in the church I was at, and they were great people. And I think they would have scored really high on some of these character traits and moral commitments and moral codes that Paul's talking about, these behaviours. They seemed like good people. And I remember just saying to God, if it's just about being a good person, I'm not really interested. I'm not interested in this being good and this good behaviour. I was naturally a good kid anyway. I didn't feel like I needed God's help in that. I was naturally wired that way to, to be good and follow the rules. I said, God, if there's more to it than just being good and behaving well, I want to know. And that's when I started to, to really know God personally. To recognise Jesus is alive. That the Holy Spirit lives in me. And I can have relationship with Father, Son and Spirit. It's not about being a good person. That's kind of an outflow. It's about who we are in relationship to him. Our story inside his story. And we're a community of people discovering that, experiencing that, trying to understand what it means to live a life worthy of the calling that we've received. We're reframing and we can't do it in a day. We can't even do it in one sermon series. We probably can't even do it in a year. It's a lifelong commitment to renew our minds it's a long process but Paul is saying this about renewing our minds it's a new way of thinking we've got to adopt this new identity which he refers to in in that third thing the the new humanity and so he says take off your old humanity take it off take off your old humanity renew your mind and put on your new humanity. Be a child of the light. This is not actually the same coat Albert wore, we just have very similar coats. But put on this new humanity, saying take off your old humanity which is being corrupted by those deceitful desires because you're living in the dark. Be made new in the attitude of your minds and then put on your new humanity created to be like God in, in righteousness and, and holiness. And suddenly that doesn't seem so daunting to me anymore. Because actually I'm, I'm putting on something of Jesus. I haven't got to be holy, holy, holy. Because he is holy, holy, holy. And so I put on this new humanity. And for Paul it's like it's an act of faith. That I trust in Jesus. He's become, Jesus has become the version of me that I cannot be for myself. Jesus has become the version of me that I cannot be for myself. Carl Barth has a great quote on that, but putting on the new humanity is the courage to say, I, I know that I fail time and time again in becoming the person I want to be. I know that I fail time and time again to reach God's standard, let alone my own standard. I'm a high J in the Myers-Briggs. I've got very high standards, Enneagram 1. I'm, I have high standards for myself and I constantly fail my own standards, let alone God's. Let alone what Paul's talking about here, this way to live in this new humanity. 
But the good news, the gospel news, the big picture news is that in the humanity and by faith, I get to put a version of me on that I could only dream of. I get to put on a version of me that I can only dream of, becoming like Jesus. That he would be on my behalf and he's present with me every day to reshape and reframe my thinking, help me go there. So do you see what Paul's doing before he has gone on to all these moral behaviours and commitments and relationship commitments? He's saying, put on the new humanity. Be the version of you that you couldn't be on your own. Put Jesus' redemption on you, his forgiveness on you, his, his grace on you. And live your story in the light of that. I just find that fascinating that I've gone decades where I've just seen this this moral code, this list of behaviours. Don't do this, do this. Don't do this, you can do this. Don't act like that, act like this. And I never saw that I didn't have to do that on my own. I didn't have to be the best Jody. I just had to invite Jesus in and put on my new humanity and the truth of chapters one, two, and three to live a life like God's called me to. And so Paul goes really practical then. And he goes through all these different scenarios about our relationship, what it means to be in community and in health with one another in our relationships. And he addresses so much. He addresses lying in verse 25. He talks about you know, lying versus being a truth teller. The word truth is around here somewhere there, over there. We've hung them up. But it goes on about you know, this lying versus telling the truth. You know, it used to lie and then give a different perception of who you were, kind of a better identity, a different persona. You used to lie about yourself in your old humanity, but now you're a truth teller. You tell the truth. You know, we're all messed up, so we tell the truth. Don't be ashamed of that. He talks about relational stuff. He talks about our anger and, and not sinning in our anger. He doesn't say don't get angry. He says don't sin in your anger. Now, what do we do with anger in this new humanity? Well, we, we deal with conflict better. <laughs> we move towards conflict resolution and we, we work together on that. We go to people. We talk about, um, we, about it with them. We work towards forgiveness. He talks about stealing. So why would you steal? It goes back to those deceitful desires again. We steal because... Um, We've made ourselves the hero of the story. We've made ourselves, our desires, um, the be-all and end-all. So to do this, I need to get that. And actually, when we put Jesus at the centre and live in this new self and love God as we love others, we, we don't need to steal anymore. Unwholesome talk. He talks about unwholesome talk and that word unwholesome being rotten. Don't, don't talk rotten. That's going to be my new phrase. Don't talk rotten. Why would we want to talk rotten to one another? I mean, yes, there's talk about don't tell dirty jokes and coarse joke and coarse language. But this is more than that. This is don't talk rot to one another. Why would I want to introduce rot into Michelle's life or Nathan's life or Haley's life? Why would I want to talk rot into their life? I'm part of the new humanity. This is my new self. I want to speak life and, and fruit and encouragement into their lives. And so we, we, don't, we no longer talk like that. We no longer talk with rot and introducing rot into people's lives because we've got our new humanity on. Our new humanity is the version of me that Jesus would be. So I want to speak f- life and fruitfulness. And he talks about, throughout chapters 4 and 5, this encouragement on how to live as children of light in God's story. And, and like Tim Mackey said right at the beginning, the, the framing our life story inside of God's story. So I'm going to finish with one final kind of thought. Because in the crossover between chapter 4 and chapter 5, it says this from verse 31. It says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering 
and sacrifice to God. It's easy, isn't it, after kind of first reading this barrage of moral failings, commands, that it's, it's easy to feel rubbish, actually. It's easy to feel, do you know what? I suck as a person. I know that I lied yesterday, or I know that I didn't speak life into someone's family, or I spoke a bit rot. It's really hard, and kind of feel like, Paul, stop telling me what to do. And so I love how he wraps that first bit of talking about kind of how to live and how to behave, and the next bit that Yoanda read about how to live and how to behave, and then going on to the tough passages about wives and husbands and, and slaves and masters and children and parents. He wraps that in these couple of verses about love. He says, follow God's example as dearly loved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us. So he repeats love three times. And so he doesn't, he kind of goes down to this core truth of our community, of new humanity. And he goes and he says, it doesn't appeal to some abstract idea, some theology. He appeals to a story, the story of the cross, the story of Jesus, the big picture story of his life and death, and he calls it an act of love. And this is a way in which the New Testament and Paul completely redefines our, our thinking on love and where we need to be made new again. And you spoke into that so beautifully a couple of weeks ago. Because in the New Testament, love is agape, agape, depending on your teaching. But you know, we think of love in English, in the English language, as an emotion. But you clearly told us the other week, and it says in scriptures that love refers to an action. Love is a verb. And we act for the well-being of others regardless of how they respond to me, agape. It's a basic core ethic of this new humanity that we are. This agape love, to walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself to us. So I now run, or we run every decision, every word that I speak, every way I relate to somebody, every conflict I'm in, and how I'm going to resolve it, I run it all through this story of agape love, this new framework how do I love this person in this circumstance as a part of my expression and my identity of a being a new human? How do I love this person in light of being a new human? And that's the core motivation because because we're loved, we walk in the way of love. And that's the, that's the, that's the biggie. That's the one to take away today. These tricky passages about how we should live, how we should submit to one another, wives and husbands, husbands and wives, parents and children, children and parents, masters and slaves, slaves and masters in that time. It reframes it in love. Because we were loved, we now walk in love. So how do I, in this tricky circumstance, in, in this relationship, in this moment, how do I love this person? in light of my new humanity, in light of the big picture story, God's story, in light of the Father's love for me? How do I wear my new humanity really well in this moment? And we run it through that framework. And that, for me anyway, changes my life story. It changes, it renews my mind, and so my behavior will change. And like I said, it's not going to happen in a day. It's not going to happen in a sermon series. It's not going to happen in a year. But it will happen if we hang around one another and encourage one another to live in this framework of God's story, of this new humanity, of his love for us. And our behaviour will, will start to change. And that's the tension Paul invites us into, is that... He's saying, guys, in light of God's story, this is how you should live your story. Not because it's a 
good way to live, not because it's a high moral code, not because it's a high moral commitment and relational commitment, but because it's framed in his story. It's framed in his love for us. And it's framed in this new humanity, which is your true identity. So it says, take off the old humanity, the one that's, the desires are deceitful. Renew our minds and the way that we think about who we are in him. And put on this new humanity, this new self, that we might live in true holiness and righteousness like God. Why don't we pray together before we worship? I'm going to pray for, for, for those of us who maybe have never, never taken the gospel story, never heard Jesus' story and, and taken off our old humanity. We've tried to kind of live with our old humanity and a little bit of the new humanity. It's just really messy. I want to pray that for some of us, and maybe wherever you are right now, if you're with people in a room, you might want to, if it's appropriate to do so, take off an outer layer. Just as an act of, do you know what? I'm going to take off my old humanity and put on the new humanity. That I might reframe how I live. So, Father, I thank you for your story. I thank you for the story of love that frames our lives. I thank you that you call us a new human. And you call us to live a life in light of that. And, Father, I'm sorry where I've worn my old humanity at times, where I've lived in the dark and I've been deceived and haven't run my actions and my thoughts and and what I say and how I react to people through the, your story. I haven't framed it in love. So Father, I want to take off my old humanity today. Would you come and renew my mind by your spirit? Help me to see who I really am in you, that I might live in this new humanity that displays your story in my life story. In Jesus' name, amen.